Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the recombinant DNA technology. And so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the general overview of recombinant DNA technology. We have discussed about what are the things you need and you need to understand before you could actually be able to perform the recombinant DNA technology to generate the genetically modified organisms. In this process, we discussed or we uh, emphasized the importance of the, uh, the host cells, we have emphasized the importance of the vectors and we in the previous um, uh, like two, uh, couple of lectures, we have discussed about how these two components are very, very essential and your understanding about the host and its cognate vector is very important to successfully generate a recombinant in, in DNA so that you can be able to use that for different types of applications. Now, if you would like to utilize this information and if you would like to generate a recombinant DNA in a particular vector, you require the additional steps what need to be understand. One of the such additional step is that you are actually going to uh, learn how the gene can be cloned into a particular vector and how you can be able to screen those uh, recombinant clones so that you can be able to uh, identify the, uh, the clone which contains the gene of your interest and so on. Now, in this particular scheme, what you will see that you are actually require the first step. In the first step, you are actually going to identify or you are actually going to isolate the gene of your interest from the genome, right. Mostly we are actually working with the genomic DNA, right. Uh, in some cases you may be working with the other sources, the DNA from the other sources, but majority of the people are actually exploring the gene from the genome, right. So you are actually going to first identify and fish out the gene of, gene of your interest from the genome. Once you have done that, then you are actually going to cut that particular gene with the help of a restriction enzyme. Then uh, once you are going to generate uh, the cohesive ends, then you are actually going to do the same process with the vector and as a result you are actually going to have the cohesive ends onto the uh, gene of your interest and you are going to have the cohesive ends onto the vector. Then you are going to put them together and you are actually going to generate the recombinant DNA or you are going to put them under the ligation reactions to generate the recombinant plasmids containing the gene of your interest. Then you are going to deliver this DNA into the host of your interest, right. So, host is very, very important, right. So, you, uh, if suppose you are using the plasmids, then you are actually going to use the bacterial as a host, but if you are using the mammalian vectors or if you are using the yeast based vectors then you are going to use or you are going to choose the vector accordingly, uh, you are going to choose the host accordingly. Now once you have done that, then you are going to screen and select the transformed uh, host from the untransformed host, right. So there are classical differences between the host which is going to be transformed with the recombinant DNA uh, containing plasmids versus the host which does not have, right. So, there could be a properties which are going to used for, uh, for screening the uh, transformed uh, host versus the untransformed host. Now, once you are done with that, then you are actually going to have the transformed host containing the uh, circular plasmids containing the uh, host, uh, the gene of your interest and then you can use this for many types of applications like the protein production, you can use that for understanding the transcriptions, translations or even the replications. So, this is the full scheme where you actually require the understanding of the different processes. So, first process in this whole scheme is identification of gene of your interest, right. Now, identification of gene of interest can be done uh, by a multiple approaches. And in this particular chapter or in this particular lecture, what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss the different approaches, what we are going to use for identification of a gene of your interest 
and under what condition you will use one approach over the other and uh, how you can be able to use those approach in a uh, in a systematic way so that you can be able to get the gene of your interest. Now, what you see here is that I have given you a scheme where how you can be able to perform the gene cloning. The, just now I have elaborated all the steps. So, first step would be the isolation of your gene of interest, right? Isolation of gene of interest from the genome, right? Although here it is shown as with the help of the polymerases, but there are multiple approaches what we are going to use, right? Once you have isolated the gene of interest, then you are actually going to cut this gene of interest with the help of the gestation enzyme and you are going to generate the cohesive ends. And same you are going to do with the plasmids and then you are going to generate the circular ligated plasmid which contains the gene of interest that you are going to put it into the bacteria and then you are going to do the selection screening and all that. That is all we have already discussed. Now from the genome, uh, there are multiple approaches one can use to isolate the gene of interest, right? And these approaches depends upon the different types of information what you have for that particular gene of interest. Now, let us see what are the different approaches one can use for isolating the gene of interest. So, there are different approaches for the isolation of gene of interest. These approaches depends whether the gene sequence is known or whether the gene sequence is not known. Right? So, whether the gene sequence is not known or whether the gene sequence is known. So, before the pre-genomic era, people were mostly using this approach, okay, when the gene sequences were not known, right. So, in that cases, you were using the two different types of approaches, one where you are actually going to uh, isolate the gene of interest utilizing the genomic library or uh, in the second approach, you are actually working with the transcriptome and you are actually going to use the cDNA library. Whereas, when the post genomic era, when the people have started sequencing the different types of organisms, so they started sequencing the human genome, mycobacterium, Leishmania, they have isolated the malaria, they have you know they have started sequencing the genomes, right. So, and that actually gives the additional advantage that you actually know the gene sequence. So, that is give you the third approach where you actually know the gene sequence and when you know the genomic sequences, what you can do is you can actually be able to utilize with the help of the polymerase chain reactions utilizing the, uh, uh, the primers. So, we will discuss first about the how you can be able to use the different types of libraries for producing the uh, for identifying the gene of your interest which is a traditional approach. And then subsequent to that we are also going to discuss about the polymerase chain reactions and how you can be able to use the PCR for uh, um, amplifying a gene of your sequence or gene of your interest and how you can be able to use that for cloning. Now first discuss about the genomic library and then we will discuss about the cDNA library. Uh, and uh, the way I have planned this lecture that first we are going to understand how you can be able to prepare a genomic library, how you can be able to prepare the cDNA library and once you have prepared the libraries, then you can be able to use the screening methods to identify the gene of your interest. So, we will take up the screening methods simultaneously for both the genomic for, for both different types of libraries and then once you have screened, you can actually be able to get the fragment which contains the gene of your interest and then how you can be able to clone that fragment into a vector of your choice and that is how you are actually going to get the clone uh, which you are required for producing or for uh, understanding the downstream applications. So, let us start first understanding the genomic library and then we will discuss about the cDNA library. These are the some of the steps which are required for the construction of the genomic library. So, I have taken an example of the human genome, right? Uh, and the human genome is actually been uh, the, the genomic library for the human genome is being produced in a vector which is called as yeast artificial vector because it can actually hold the very big sizes, right? So, the first step is you are actually first in the first step you are actually going to isolate the genome of the genome of the particular organism. So, in this case we are actually were uh, giving you an example of the human genome. 
so first step is you are actually going to isolate the human genome human genome now once you isolated the human genome then you are actually going to generate the different types of fragments so you are actually going to generate the fragments and these fragments can be generated with the help of the different types of methods so in the step 1 you are actually going to do the isolation of the genomic dna in this case we are working with the human genome then you are actually going to generate the fragments these fragments could be of suitable size they could be very they, they should not be very big and they should not be very small we'll discuss all these in detail when we will take up individual steps then you are actually going to uh, purify the uh, fragments okay and uh, once you purify the fragments you are actually going to have the individual fragments so you are going to have the individual fragments which means when you um, when I, when we say that you are actually going to uh, purify the dna fragment that means you are actually going to uh, uh, exclude the undigested or un uh, fragmented uh, genome which means uh, very large size fragment we are going to exclude so that we are actually going to have the individual fragments and then the last step 4 you are actually going to uh, insert that into a suitable vector so in this case we are taking the yak vectors so you are actually going to do the uh, insertion into suitable vector right in this case we are taking an example of yak which is the yeast artificial chromosome because we are taking the example of human genome uh, if, if you do the other organisms you probably could use the back or the even other kinds of plasmids then you are actually going to deliver this uh, circular dna into a suitable host right so you are actually going to uh, do the DNA delivery into a suitable host and this is what is called as genomic library. So, you are actually going to get uh, colonies into which will contain or which will actually going to represent the genomic uh, content of that particular DNA irrespective of whether the content is expressing a protein or whether it is not expressing the protein. So, the genomic library actually represent the genomic uh, content of the organism which means it is going to represent all the genes it is actually going to represent all genes irrespective of their expression status. Okay. Now, let us see how you can be able to prepare the genomic library. So, if you remember the first step is isolation of the genomic DNA, the second step is you are going to generate the fragments, the third step is you are actually going to purify these fragments so that you can be able to remove the big fragments and as well as the undigested genome. Then you are actually going to ligate or insert the, uh, the fragments into a suitable vector. In this case, we are taking an example of VAC. Uh, and then the next step is you are going to deliver this DNA into a suitable host. So, in this case we are taking an example of yeast. Now, let us talk about the step 1. So, the step 1 is the isolation of the genomic DNA. As I said we are taking an example of the human genome, but the steps could vary when you are talking about the prokaryotic system versus the eukaryotic system because the first step is going to be different okay or uh, for example if we are talking about the genomic library which is going to be prepared from the uh, some particular type of tissue right for example some kind of liver or uh, for example cancer cells right so in that case also the some of the isolation step could be vary or could uh, vary from this particular thing so, the step 1 you are actually going to lyse the cells with the detergent containing the lysis buffer Slices buffers normally contains the detergent right. So, detergent are actually going to uh, lyse the cell wall right or even the they are actually going to lyse the plasma membrane. 
Before this, if you are actually going to work with the cultured cells or if you are actually going to work with the tissue, then you are actually going to do a additional step that means you are actually going to homogenize uh, these uh, uh, cultured cells or the tissue so that you are actually going to get the single cell suspension, single uh, cell uh, suspension. And this single cell suspension can be used for the lysis step. So, in the lysis step, you're, you would like to ensure that all the cells are actually going to lyse, and then they should actually going to release the content of the D, uh, of their cell, which means they are actually going to release the genomic uh, DNA because they, they are uh, once you put them under the lysis uh, conditions, they it is actually going to destroy the plasma membrane. It is actually going to destroy the membrane which is around the uh, organelles, right? So it is actually going to release the whole content, okay? And then the uh, it is going to release the, all the content. So it is actually going to release what it is going to release. It is actually going to release the DNA, uh, which is uh, from the nucleus, right? If we are talking about the human, right? It is also going to release the protein, and it is also going to release the lipid of the particular cell, right? And it also going to minor, um, in the minute quantity, it may release the carbohydrates. And then uh, this lysate, what you are going to get is you are actually going to do the digestion. So, in the step 1, you are actually going to do the lysis step. In the step 2, you are going to do a digestion. So, you are incubating the cells with a digestion buffer, which contains the proteinase K SDS to release the genomic DNA from the DNA protein complexes. Now, this is very, very uh, interesting that you know that within the nucleus, even the DNA is been released, right? The DNA is always been present in complex with the uh, histones, right? And uh, that's how they are actually making the the chromosomes, and they are also be a part of nucleosomes, right? So this histone is protecting the DNA from the any kind of degradations, right? And it also packs the DNA in a very very compact structure. Now. Uh, the second step would be that you want to release the DNA from the DNA protein complexes. So, for that purpose, what you are doing is you are treating the whole uh, protein with the whole lysate with the help of a protease. So, the protease job is that it is actually going to degrade the proteins, right? You know that the proteases are required for degrading the protein part. And then you are adding the SDS, so the protein is also going to be denatured, so that it is going to be uh, easier for the protein SK to digest the protein part. Once the protein is being digested, it is act or histones are being digested, it is actually going to release the DNA into the solution. Then what you are going to do is next step you are going to isolate the genomic DNA by the alcohol precipitations. Alcohol is actually going to remove the water around the DNA and as a result the DNA is not going to be soluble into the solution and as a result the DNA is going to be precipitated. Then the step 4, step 4 is actually a purification step where you are actually going to purify the genomic DNA with the help of the phenol chloroform mixture because whatever the DNA you are going to precipitate with the absolute alcohol is going to contain the DNA and it also going to contain the protein because the protein is also present into the solution, right? So, it is actually going to contain the DNA and as it also going to contain the protein. Now, we do not want this protein, right? So, we only want the DNA, right? So, what we are going to do is we are going to take this whole uh, mixture and then we are actually going to purify the genomic DNA with the help of the phenol chloroform mixture. So, what we are going to do is we are going to take the chloroform phenol mixture and we are going to mix 1 is to 1 ratio, right? And we are going to mix it properly. And in that case, what will happen is that you are actually going to get two phases. You are going to get an aqueous phase and you are actually going to get an organic phase. In the aqueous phase, you are actually going to get the DNA, right? Whereas in the organic phase, it is actually going to contain the proteins. Whereas in the aqueous phase, you are actually going to contain the DNA. 
So, uh, you are going to get the two phases aqueous phase because you are adding the um, you know the you are actually going to have the DNA into the water right. So, it is going to give you the aqueous phase and then you also going to have the organic phase which is going to be formed by the uh, chloroform right and uh, phenol right. So, chloroform in phenol is actually going to precipitate the protein part right and in this step the phenol denature the remaining protein and keep it keep the protein into the organic phase which means now we are have removed the protein from the DNA and we only have the pure DNA left right. So, what we are going to do is we are going to collect this uh, top uh, supernatant and keep it into the next tube and then we are actually going to uh, precipitate. So, the next step is you are going to separate the genomic DNA present in the aqueous phase into and again it is going to be precipitated with the help of the absolute alcohol and then you are actually going to uh, you know analyze it onto a 0.8 percent agarose gel and a good preparation of genomic DNA give an intact band with a no visible smear. So, what you see here is that this is a picture of a genomic DNA which is been analyzed onto a agarose gel. So, what you see here is that it is actually going to show you a band which is very close to the well because the genomic DNAs are very uh, very heavy actually. So, they will not going to run very fast compared to like uh, you might have seen the uh, plasmid DNA right plasmid DNA runs very faster because uh, if you recall uh, in the previous two previous lectures we have shown you how to isolate the plasmids from the uh, from the transformed cells and uh, when the students have run it onto the agarose gel it was running uh, with three bands right and those three bands were running at a very very far distance from the well because they are of small in size the genomic DNA of the human genomic DNA is very heavy compared to the plasmid DNA. So, once you got the uh, pure mammalian DNA right then you can be able to use this into the next step and the next step is generating the fragments right. So, next step is that you take this genomic DNA and break it into the small 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 pieces. So, that each small piece can be inserted into a suitable vector and that combi that collection of those clones are nothing but the representation of the genomic DNA into a form of the genomic library. So, let us see what are the things you need to do when you are want to generate the fragments. So, this is the step 2 right the step 2 uh, you want to generate the suitable size fragments. This uh, there are multiple method one can actually do uh, for generating the fragments. For example, if you have a DNA right this is a you can imagine right these are the different types of genes what are present right you can actually have the introns you can have an exons and all that right. So, what the first method I could use is I can just treat this with a restriction enzyme right. So, what will happen is the restriction enzyme is going to cut this whole genome at multiple places and that is how I am going to get the fragments of the different sizes right. Uh, the second method this is the first method ok and the second method could be that I am going to treat this with a mechanical uh, sharing ok. So, if I trade this and uh, do a mechanical sharing which means I will just mix it and then vertex it for example. So, if I give them a multiple uh, the mechanical forces then what will happen is it is going to break randomly at multiple places and that also is going to give me the fragments which are random right. So, it can get broken at any places because genomic DNA is very long thread right. So, if it is a long thread if you you know if you uh, apply any kind of mechanical force it is going to be get broken down. The only difference between this and this would be that it may uh, when you are treating it with the restation enzyme it may have the coincidence when you are treating it with the mechanical method then it may not have the, uh, the coincidence. So, one method is that you are going to have the restriction digestions. So, genomic DNA can be digested with a frequent DNA conding enzyme such as ECO R1, BAMH1 or SAW 3A to generate the random sizes of the DNA fragment. The criteria to choose the restriction enzyme or pair of enzyme in such a way so that a reasonable size DNA fragment will be generated. 
As fragments are randomly generated and are relatively big enough, it is likely that each and every fragment is, pre is presented in the pool. As size of the DNA fragment is large, complete genome will be presented in a very few number of clones, right. So, when you are generating the suitable size fragments, you also should ensure that each and every gene could be represented in one fragment. It should not be presented in two or multiple fragments, right. So, it should not be so small fragment that the single gene is being represented into the multiple fragments and it should not be so big that you are actually having the multiple genes uh, within the single fragments and that you are actually going to optimize by treating the genomic DNA with a single restriction enzyme or a combination of restriction enzyme or you are actually going to optimize by multiple types of restriction enzyme parameters such as how long you want to treat, how uh, what will be the amount of DNA you are going to treat and so on. So, that all details you will understand when we will discuss about the restriction enzyme in our subsequent lectures. Uh, in other methods, the DNA genomic DNA can be fragmented using a mechanical sharing, right. Now, the question comes at this stage that how many fragments should be generated? Because it is very difficult to say whether the fragment is representing one gene or the fragments are uh, one gene is being represented in multiple genes. So, the question comes how many fragments should be generated, right? So that, so that it sh may represent whole genome, right? Which means every gene is being represented by single, uh, single, uh, single clone, right? Now there's there's no uh, there's no uh, guideline. But there is a there is a particular type of formula, right? The for particular formula is which is based on the probability and as well as the size of the fragment and as well as the size of the genome. That you should actually be able to generate a fragment so that there could be multiple fragments representing the same genome. So, if for example, if an organism has a genome size of two to power seven. 2 to power uh, 2 into 10 to power 7 kb and uh, average size of the fragment is 20 kb right then number of fragment would be 10 to power 6 right in reality this is the minimum number to represent a given fragment in the library where the actual number is much larger so to find the probability of finding a particular genomic sequences in a random library of n independent clone would be that n is equal to natural log 1 minus p divided by natural log 1 minus 1 by n, where the uh, n is the number of clones, right? n would be the number of clones, p would be the probability and n, small n would be the size of the average fragment size, right? And this kind of probability or this kind of formula can be used to know how many clones I should generate or how many fragments I should generate so that I could be able to uh, you know with a maximum probability that I should represent each and every gene into a particular fragment and that kind of uh, guide uh, uh, you know formulas will be very useful for knowing whether I have generated the enough fragments or not right. For example, so for example, this is right. If you have a genome size of 2 to power 2 into 10 to power 7 and the fragment size is 20 kb, then I should actually get 10 to power 6 clones, which means I should get 10 to power 6 colonies into the this particular plate, right? When I am going to transform these fragments into the particular type of vector or particular type of host. But if I am not getting that number, if I am not getting the 10 to power 6 colonies, that means the fragment size is very low. That means you are under representing the particular genomic library, right? Uh, and if that is the case, the probability of finding a particular fragment into a genomic library could be very, very low. And uh, we should we should then restart the whole process of generating the genomic library, which means I should achieve at least this number so that 
at least one fragment will appear once in each colony right although the the basic number should be even bigger to this right and these kind of calculations are very very helpful so that it will tell you the probability of finding a particular fragment into your colony now the third step is the cloning into the so step 3 is the cloning into the suitable vector right so there are genome sizes of the different organisms what you see here is the genome sizes of the different vector uh, different uh, organisms starting from the mycoplasma to the flowering plants flowering plants are actually having the genomic size of the very high which is into 10 to power 11 base pair whereas the mycoplasma would be in the range of 10 to power 6 base pair or less than 10 to power 6 base pair and you have a gram positive bacteria gram negative bacteria fungi algae and all that so all these i have given here and they are actually vary in terms of their genomic sizes and accordingly you are actually going to generate the fragments right accordingly you are generate going to generate the fragments and you are actually going to ensure that you are actually going to have the enough number of fragments so that you will represent each and every genomic content in of that particular organisms. So, the step 3 you are going to clone this into these fragments into a suitable vector. The suitable vector do prepare the genomic library can be selected based on the size of the fragment of genomic DNA and carrying capacity of the vector size of the average fragment can be calculated and accordingly a suitable vector can be choosed. In the case of fragments generated by the digestion enzyme vector can be digested with the same enzyme and put for ligation to get the clone. In the case of mechanical sharing mediated fragment generation putting these fragment need additional efforts for example you need to you, you need to you know make the fragments cohesive. In one of the approach an adopter molecule can be used to generate the sticky ends alternatively an uh, endonuclease nucleus can be used to generate the sticky end. So, you do not have to worry about these uh, terminologies like for example, endonuclease, adapter molecules or linker molecules and all that because that all we are going to use or we are going to discuss when we will discuss about the tools of the uh, tools required for the gene cloning right. So, that time we will discuss all this right. So, we are actually going to have the genome of the you know different varying sizes and accordingly you are going to generate the different types of fragments and fragment size is also going to uh, vary right. So, you are also going to first of all you are going to have the number of fragments and you are also going to have the fragment size and according to the fragment size you are actually going to use the suitable vector. How you are going to use you are going to use take care of a carrying capacity of individual vectors right. So, for example, the plasmids, plasmid will have the maximum carrying capacity of 15 um, um, uh, uh, base pair or uh, 15 uh, uh, kilo base pair this is not mb this is the kilo base pair right. And then we have the phage lambda which is 25 kilo base pair uh, then we have a cosmids which is 45 kilo base pair then we have a bacteriophage vector which are 17, 7200 kilo base pair. Then we have the back which is from 120 to 300 kilo base pair and then we have a yeast which is from the 250 to 2000 kilo base pair. So, according to the fragment size you can actually be able to take the carry uh, the different uh, vectors and you can be able to use that for uh, generating the recombinant uh, circular DNA. Then you the step uh, next step next step 4 you are actually going to transform this into the uh, uh, into the vector into the host. So, the post ligation the clones are transformed into a suitable host to get the colonies. A suitable host can be bacterial stain or the yeast. Different methods of delivering clone into the host is discussed into the future lecture. This is the anyway we are going to discuss when we will discuss about the DNA delivery into the host. So, that time we will take up the uh, bacterial host, we will take up the mammalian host and so on right. Now, once you are done you are actually have generated the genomic library and what is as I said genomic library is actually going to gen, going to represent the genomic content of the cell right genomic content of cell that will be for uh, non expression cells or for the expression cells right which means 
it does not matter whether it is a expression uh, construct or the non expression construct which means it is actually going to represent the introns it is also going to represent the exons. Now, once we generated the genomic library we will go back to the our approaches again right. So, first approach we have discussed we have discussed about how you can be able to prepare the genomic library. Now, as I said the genomic library is only representing the genomic content right that is actually uh, only be useful when you are trying to fish out a particular gene fragment uh, irrespective of its expression status. But suppose you know that the expression of a particular gene is uh, or those kind of features you would like to use right. For example, if I would like to isolate a gene which is responsible for the skin complexion right or skin color right. So, in that case I actually know that the this particular uh, protein is going to express and that is how it is actually going to give me the skin color right. So, in that case I actually have a particular tool to identify the express genes right I, I, I can be able to identify the express genes right. So, uh, in that case what I can do is I can actually be able to uh, instead of isolating the genomic DNA that time I can actually be able to isolate the messenger RNA right. If I isolate the messenger RNA pool that will be called as the transcriptome of that particular cell ok. So, in this case we have isolated the genomic DNA in this case we are actually going to isolate the transcriptome which means I am going to isolate the messenger RNA then from there I am going to generate the cDNA library and this cDNA library is actually going to represent the expression uh, construct or expression status of particular cell ok. So, this means I can use the cDNA library to compare what will be the expression of a particular construct under two different types of conditions like for example, if somebody is developing the cancer or if somebody you are supposed treating a particular patient with a particular type of drug for example, paracetamol. Now, if you would like to know if I take the one tablet of paracetamol how it is actually changing the expression profiling of different genes or how it is actually over expressing a particular gene or how it is under expressing a particular gene and so on that you can be able to do with the help of the cDNA library considering that you have the suitable uh, probes or suitable screening methods. So, that you can be able to identify a particular protein or particular uh, DNA. So, let us discuss first about uh, how you can be able to prepare the cDNA library and once you prepare the cDNA library then you can actually be able to we will discuss about the screening methods. Now, these are the some of the steps what require for the construction of a cDNA library ok. As I said the cDNA library means it is going to ex represent the expression status of the cell right. So, it is going to be used for that purpose. So, the first step is you are actually going to isolate and collect the messenger RNA the total messenger RNA of the particular cell the total messenger RNA of the cell right. So, this is the step 1 in the step 1 you are actually going to collect the total messenger RNA of that particular cell which will be under different types of treatments or belonging to the different groups. For example, uh, if you want to ident identify the uh, the proteins which are required for the skin color right. So, you can actually take the some samples from the different types of individuals and you can be able to do a uh, subtractive analysis. So, all this actually we are not discussing in detail, but that is a very very high put, uh, you know robust potential of the cDNA library. So, once you isolated the uh, messenger RNA, so you have isolated the RNA right then you are going to convert this RNA into a DNA which is called as cDNA right. So, this is going to be the step 2 where you are actually going to convert the RNA into the cDNA right or complementary DNA right. Once you generated the DNA then you are actually going to 
fragment this but uh, then you are going to insert that into a suitable vector in this case we are taking an example of bacterial plasmids and that is how it is actually going to give you the different types of clones each clone will contain the different messenger RNA fragments and then you are going to insert the so this is going to be the step 3 right where you are actually going to clone this DNA into a suitable vector right in this case I have taken an example of plasmid. Then the step 4 you are actually going to use the DNA delivery method and you are going to insert these plasmids into a bacteria and that is how you are going to get the different types of clones right. So, you are going to get and this collection of these clones are going to be called as cDNA library ok. Now, this you can be able to use for different types of applications you can actually be able to isolate a particular type of gene or a particular type of gene which is responsible for skin color or you can actually be able to identify a particular gene which is expressing a particular protein. So, let us start and discussing about how you can be able to isolate and collect the messenger RNA step 1 in the step 2 how you can be able to convert this messenger RNA into the DNA and then how you can be able to clone that DNA into the clones right the bacterial plasmids and how you can be able to insert that into the bacteria and you can get the same different types of colonies. So, the step 1 um, will uh, where you are going to isolate the messenger RNA. So, if you want to isolate the messenger RNA you have to understand first the structure of the messenger RNA. So, I am sure you will you will discuss in detail about the structure of the messenger RNA when you will discuss about the transcription right. So, when I am sure in any of the molecular biology book you should actually be able to uh, understand the complete structure of the messenger RNA. Uh, here we are very briefly going to talk about the structure of the messenger RNA. So, if you see the structure of the messenger RNA what you have is you have a 5 prime cap right which is. Uh, uh, where you have the you know uh, uh, cyclide cyclide gonyl cap right. So, you have a 5 prime cap then you have the 5 prime UTR. So, these are the uh, region which is required for the uh, generating the different types of uh, you know the RNA polymerase and all that right. Then this is the coding sequence. So, this is the sequence which is actually going to be responsible for generating the protein right. And then on this end you are going to have the 3 prime end so which is actually going to bind the regulatory elements right and then it is also going to have the poly A tail. So, this is going to be called as poly A tail right and uh, this is I am talking about uh, the eukaryotic uh, um, uh, eukaryotic RNA right. Uh, in the prokaryotic RNA the structure remains the same except uh, and uh, in the eukaryotic RNA you may have the within the coding sequence you may have the different types of the introns and exon which are actually eventually going to be replaced spliced out and that is how you are going to have the final sequence. So, uh, once you collect the messenger RNA you are actually going to have this right. Now, if I want to isolate this particular type of molecules I could actually by looking at the structure I have to devise a strategy so that I could not be able to purify this right and I should not purify any other messenger RNA or any other RNA right. For example, within the RNA what you have the three different types of RNA right. You have the messenger RNA, you have the ribosomal RNA and you have the tRNA right. So, if I use this coding sequence or 5 prime UTR or 3 prime UTR and if I want to use that as a tool to purify then I may actually be able to have the background of the ribosomal RNA or tRNA. Now, messenger RNA is very specific because of this poly A tail right. So, this poly A tail is actually containing a A A A A sequence like that ok and length of this sequence depends and length of this sequence actually decides the stability of the messenger RNA and that can be uh, be a very very handy tools for isolating the messenger RNA from a particular uh, cell life set. How you can do that? You know that the uh, nucleotides are having the base pairing rules right. So, A is always making a, a double um, a hydrogen bonding with the T whereas G is always making a 3 hydrogen bonding with the C and these 
base pairing is very very specific right you cannot have any other combinations of the base pairing this means if i want to isolate this particular type of uh, molecule which actually contains a series of a's i can what i can do is i can just take a bead and if i put the t in nucleotides on this right so what will happen is that this a is actually go will go and bind right this is messenger rna right and it will specifically will go to bind this particular bead right and that is what exactly we are going to do with the help of the affinity purifications you will be able to isolate the messenger rna okay so these are the some of the steps how you can be able to isolate the messenger rna from the cell lysate so what you are going to do is you are going to take the cells you are going to treat them with the lysis buffer so lysis buffer will again contain the detergents and all other kinds of molecules and that's how it is actually going to break the cells and it is actually going to release the cellular content if you are working with the tissue then you are supposed to do the homogenization so that you are actually going to generate the single cell suspension and then you can treat that with the lysis buffer and that's how you are also going to get the protein lysate or cell lysate that cell lysate will contain the messenger rna right and you know that the messenger rna will vary only in this part right so messenger rna will actually vary in the coding sequences the different messenger rnas are going to vary in the coding sequences but the 3 prime or uh, this uh, poly a tail is actually going to be present in all the messenger rna so they are actually going to have a molecule which contains this right so this is going to be the structure of the messenger rna this is going to be the coding sequence where i am just making the double bond right this is this is this is going to be coding sequence so this coding sequence uh, could be different between the different messenger rna but this poly a tail will remain the same with all the messenger rna so what you are going to do is you are going to put a bead which contains the uh, the T nucleotides right so oligo DT uh, nucleotides so you are going to take the beads and you are going to mix these beads along with the cell lysate okay now what will happen is that T is actually going to sit like this right and it is going to bind so that's it this means if once you add the beads which contains the poly T uh, linker right it is actually going to bind all the messenger rna which is present in this particular solution then you are going to wash these reactions with the help of the different types of buffers when you wash it is actually going to remove all the pro all the other proteins which will not bind to this particular bead and uh, then you are going to elute this so what you are going to use you are going to use a uh, poly a and when you add the poly a it is actually going to compete for the messenger rna and that's how it is actually going to remove the messenger rna from the beads and the beads messenger rna will going to be released into the solutions so uh, we are going to first do the binding reactions once the binding is done you are going to discard the supernatant then you are going to do washing and you are going to resuspend that into a elution buffer elution buffer will contain the different types of poly a tail and that is how you are going to collect and then you are going to spin down and separate the beads from the eluent with the help of the centrifugations and that is how it is actually going to give you the pure poly a messenger rna now this poly a messenger rna is going to be used for the step 2 where you are actually going to generate the dna or the cdna so the complementary dna or the cdna what is going to be generated right in the step 2 so this is the step 2 uh, where you are actually going to generate the complementary dna or cdna so the complementary dna synthesis is a three step process in the step 1 you are first going to strand the synthesis with the reverse transcriptase then you are going to remove the rna template and then you are going to generate the second strand synthesis and this can be done by multiple methods you can actually have the homo homopolymer tailing you can have the gubber hoffman method and many other methods which are going to be used here i am just giving you an example how you can be able to generate the complementary dna with the help of the uh, homopolymer tailing so in a homopolymer tailing you are actually going to use 
the reverse transcriptase you are going to use the uh, hydrolyze the RNA and also that. So, this method is going to exploit the presence of poly A tail present on the messenger RNA to synthesize the first DNA strand followed by the degradation of the RNA template and the synthesis of the second strand. The scheme of this uh, whole uh, homopolymer tailing sailing is method is given. First you are going to do is you are going to add the oligo DT primer which is going to be used as a template to prepare the first strand of the DNA with the help of the reverse transcriptase and DNTPs. So, in the first step what you are going to do is you are going to add the oligo DT uh, primers right. So, what will happen is it is actually going to go and bind here right the oligo DT and then it is actually you are going to add the DNTPs and then you are also going to add the reverse transcriptase. You know that the reverse transcriptase is actually going to synthesize the DNA from utilizing the RNA template right. So, they are called as RNA dependent DNA polymerase which is exactly reverse than the uh, the, uh, the uh, RNA polymerase right. So, it is al almost a reversal of what RNA polymerase is doing. RNA polymerase it is synthesizing the RNA from the DNA whereas, reverse transcriptase is synthesizing the DNA from the RNA. So, in the first case you are going to use the RNA primers right. So, you are going to use the poly primer and you are going to put and as a result it is actually going to synthesize the first strand. So, this is the first strand this is the DNA and this is your messenger RNA which means it is actually going to have a hybrid molecule. In the first step you are going to generate a hybrid molecule which contains the messenger RNA and you are also going to have the cDNA. Now, when you load this uh, hybrid molecule onto a alkaline sucrose gradient and you know that the alkaline solution is always uh, messenger RNA is very sensitive for the alkaline solution. So, it will actually going to hydrolyze the RNA and it is also going to recover the full length cDNA molecules. It means you have removed the RNA by putting this uh, whole reaction into a alkaline sucrose gradient and as a result it is actually going to have the cDNA. Now, this cDNA you are actually going to put along with the oligo G uh, reverse transcriptase plus DNTPs and it is actually going to give you the second strand synthesis and as a result you are going to get the double duplex DNA or you are going to use the duplex DNA by inserting that into the vector. So, in the second step after the synthesis of first strand the terminal transferase is used to add the C nucleotide on the 3 prime of the both messenger RNA and newly synthesized first strand of the DNA. DNA hi RNA hybrid is loaded onto a alkaline sucrose gradient and this step will hydrolyze the RNA and allow the full recovery of the cDNA. Next an oligo G G DG primer is used with the cDNA as a template to prepare the second strand of the DNA with the help of the reverse transcriptase and DNTPs. Now, the second method is the gubber hoffman method. So, in the gubber hoffman method uh, you are actually going to use the reverse transcriptase and DNTPs. First uh, in this approach the first uh, strand synthesis using the oligo DT primer in the presence of reverse transcriptase and the DNTPs. DNA hydrogen hybrid is treated with the RNA's H to produce the NIC at the multiple site. The DNA polymerase is used to perform the DNA synthesis using the multiple fragment of RNA as a primer to synthesize the new DNA strand and this method produce the blunt and double standard DNA right. So, in this one what you are going to do is the first step remain the same what we have just discussed in the homopolymer tailing and then it is actually going to have the messenger RNA on one side and the DNA on the other side and then if you take these two uh, and you, if you treat it with the RNA H, RNA H has the property that it is actually going to degrade the messenger RNA at multiple places. So, it is as a result what will happen is that it is actually going to produce the different fragments right. Now, utilizing these fragment as a primer you can be able to synthesize the second strand. So, what will happen is that the RNA DNA polymerase is going to sit in here and it is actually going to utilize this as a primer right for this particular template and it is actually going to synthesize the whole DNA and as a result it is actually going to give you the duplex DNA which can be inserted into the next step into the vector right just like what we have discussed for the genomic library and then you can be able to utilize that for screening purposes. So, till then what we have discussed we have discussed about the genomic library 
preparation of the genomic library and we have also discussed about the preparation of the cDNA library right. Now, once you generated the genomic library or the cDNA library you can be able to go to the next step and the next step is the screening part right. So, you can be able to use the different types of screening method how you can be able to screen the genomic library or the cDNA library. The method of screening could be different but the basic funda remains the same basic funda remains the same that in some cases you will use the one screening method for the genomic library and that could be exclusive only for the genomic library that may not apply to the cDNA library and in some cases some of the methods are only exclusive for the cDNA library but not for the genomic library. So, how you are going to screen this library so that you can get the suitable fragments. So, the screening uh, can be done by three different methods. First, you can use the DNA sequence, you can use the expression of a particular protein with the immunogenic epitope which means you are actually going to have a antibody which can actually recognize a particular protein or you can actually have the enzymatic activity so that that can be used for identifying a particular protein. So, in the DNA sequence this property can be used to screen both the genomic library and the cDNA library ok. So, this is common this can be used for both the libraries. The other two method that the expression of a particular protein with the immunogenic probe this property can be partially useful for screening the genomic library due to a truncation of a full gene or no expression of a gene fragment, but this approach suits well to screen the cDNA clones. Then we have an enzymatic activity. So, this active uh, property exploit the ability of a protein fragment to exhibit the enzymatic activity. It is useful only for the screening of cDNA library, but not much for the genomic library because you do not know whether the protein fragment what or the genomic fragment what you have generated will actually going to give you a functional enzyme or not. Now, screening by the DNA hybridization. So, you, this we have already discussed right A and T are actually going to have the specific uh, 2 hydrogen bonding whereas, G and C is actually going to have the 3 hydrogen bonding and that can be used for screening by the DNA hybridization. Now, what you are going to do in the DNA hybridization in the DNA hybridization you are first going to prepare a master plate right. So, you are, you are going to have a master plate where you are actually going to have the different types of clones right. So, you are going to have all the clones. So, from the master plate first step is you are going to generate the replica plate ok. Now, this replica plate you are going to treat with the help of the radioactive probes. For example, whatever the DNA sequence you want to uh, you know use for screening right you can actually be able to put a radioactivity. So, that when it goes and bind to the its uh, complementary DNA it will actually going to give you a signal right. So, you can actually be able to treat that with the uh, radio radioactive probe and what will happen is the radioactive will probe will actually go and bind to that particular uh, protein or particular genomic sequences which is present within the clone and as a result you can be able to identify this particular clone uh, because it is actually going to give you the spots. So, for this particular type of hybrid screening you first step is that you are actually going to prepare a radioactive probe right and uh, generating the radioactive probe can be done with the help of the different types of methods. So, what we are discussing is a single simple method that is called as random primer methods. So, in the random primer method uh, a random primer is used to anneal to the template and then a PCR reaction is performed in the presence of the radio labeled nucleotide. After the PCR the newly synthesized DNA strand is labeled with the radio nucleotide. So, this is simple we are actually doing the PCR in the with the in the presence of the radioactive nucleotide and what will happen is it is actually going to incorporate this radioactive uh, nucleotide uh, wherever it will find the uh, the complementary sequences. Uh, so, these are the some different uh, these are the methods right. So, uh, what we going to go through the different steps right. So, uh, in, the in the first step you are actually going to do the you know you are going to add the primers you are going to allow them to hybridize and then you are actually going to generate the different types of the small 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 fragments and then you are actually going to allow the DNA synthesis with the help of the clonov and the four different types of nucleotides 
which in in among which one of the nucleotide is going to be radioactive and then you are actually going to have the radio labeled. Similarly, you can actually be able to use the terminal transferase method and that also is going to label the one of the end of the probe with the help of the radioactive uh, nucleotides. Now, how you are going to do the screening by the DNA hybridization? So, first is you are have prepared the radioactive probes, then you are going to prepare the replica plates. So, as original genomic or serial library is precious and will be consumed in a later stage, all procedure is performed with the replica plate containing clones in an identical fashion, which means this is your master plate, which is the, your genomic library. So, what you can do is because it is going to be utilized for multiple types of treatments, you do not want this to be destroyed because this can be used. So, what you do is you actually generate a replica plate, okay, which means you are actually going to generate a carbon copy of this with the help of. So, what you can do is you just add an NC membrane or nitrocellulose membrane on this and all the clones will come onto this and that can be used as a replica plate. Then you can actually do the blotting. The clone is transferred onto a nitrocellulose membrane with retaining the identical pattern of the choline as it was given on the master plate. The cells on the membranes are light and the released DNA is denatured, denaproteinated and allowed to bind the membrane. Then you do the hybridizations. A labeled probe prepared in step 1 will be added, right? that radioactive probe. Probe will be binding to the target DNA due to the base pairing in, uh, information and the membrane is washed to remove the unbound uh, probes and then you develop the probe which means you are going to do the autoradiography. The position of the labeled probe is detected by the audioradiogram. The position of the signal on the membrane can be matched with the master plate to get the location of the corresponding colony. So, for example, if you got the signal here. Then what you can do is just map this with this and you can actually know that okay, this is my clone and then you can actually be able to take out this clone and that clone is going to contain the same genomic sequences what you have used for screening that particular genomic library. Then the second step is the screening by the immunological method. So, in the immunological method uh, you are this is this first step remains the same where you are actually going to generate the uh, the replica plate, right? Then, for once you generated the replica plate, you are actually going to lyse the cells and allow the binding of the protein to the nitrocellulose membrane. Then, you are going to so you are going to have the you know all the protein which is bound to the same site where you are actually going to have the clones. Remember that the immunological method is going to be used only for the cDNA library not for the genomic library because it is very unclear whether the genomic library will express that protein or not. So, mostly it is being used for the cDNA library and then you are going to add the primary antibodies right. So, once you add the primary antibody the antibody will go and bind to this particular type of clone. So, for example, if it goes and bind to this clone right this means this clone actually contains that protein against which this particular primary antibody is being generated right. For example, if I want if I have isolated a antibody in particular pathological conditions right and I, I want to know which protein it is actually identifying right that kind of applications where you are actually going to use the cDNA library. So, you will add the primary antibody it will go and bind to the this particular type of clones and then you are actually going to add the secondary antibodies. Those who do not know about immunology, the primary antibody is the antibody which actually going to go and bind the antigen, right? Whereas, the secondary antibody is an antibody which actually will go and bind the primary antibody. And the secondary antibody is also being labeled with an enzyme so that it actually going to give you the signal. So, the secondary antibody you will again do the washing step and all those so that you can actually be able to remove the unbound pro antibodies and then you are actually going to add the substrate for this particular enzyme and the wherever the antibody is bound it is actually going to give you the signal. Once you know that this is actually the clone which is actually giving me the signal then what you can do is you can go back to your master plate and you know that okay, this is the clone of my interest and you can actually be able to take out this particular clone and you can be able to extract the DNA and you can use that for subsequent uh, downstream applications like you can actually use for gene cloning and other kinds of applications. Then the third step is the screening by the enzymatic method. 
So, this method is based on the ability of a protein to exhibit an enzymatic activity. This method is not very specific, but allow to identify a class of protein with the known enzymatic activity. The process of the enzymatic activity or enzymatic screening also remain the same that you are going to first have the master plate from there you are actually going to have the replica plate right and then you are going to do the lysis step and allow the enzyme to bind onto the nitro cells membrane. Then you are actually going to add the substrate right you are going to add the substrate for that particular enzyme for which you want to do the enzymatic activity and that is actually going to give you the enzymatic uh, uh, you know and uh, the enzymes is actually going to start working and it is going to start giving you the, uh, the, the, the change in color or those kind of phenomena and then you can actually be able to isolate the particular ex corresponding clones. Now, if the gene sequence is not known, you can be able to use the two approaches that is the genomic library approach and you can also be able to use the cDNA library approach. If the gene sequence is known, then it is straightforward, you can be able to do the PCR with the site directed uh, primers right and that can be give you the cloning right. So, once you have a you know if the gene sequence is not known you can actually have the two options right the utilizing the genomic library or the tDNA library right and once you have done the screening part right you can actually be able to get the clone fragment right. Now, how you can be able to isolate this particular gene so that you can be able to do it into the downstream cloning applications and how you can be able to use that for the expression studies. So, uh, for this what you can do is once the position of a clone is known it is extracted from the master plate and the plasmid is isolated. In few cases the clone is further diluted to check the homogeneity of the clone. The purity of the clone and the presence of clone is further tested with the PCR using a uh, sequence specific primer. So, this is what exactly what you are going to do. You are going to first suppose you got this particular clone then what you are going to do is you are going to isolate the DNA from this clone right. Uh, you may be lucky then it may actually give you only single DNA. It could be possible that when you isolate it may give you the multiple DNA right. And in that case you might have to dilute this so that this clone also you can dilute it make a new call uh, new library and then you again do the screening uh, uh, one round of screening to know that which clone is giving me the signal ok. And then ultimate testing you are going to do with the PCR with the help of a site specific primers. And once that is confirmed then you get the DNA you can actually be able to use this DNA for the downstream cloning applications. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the two approaches. So, we have discussed about the genomic library preparations, we have discussed about the cDNA library preparations, we have discussed about how you can be able to exploit both of these libraries for screening the suitable clones and how you can be able to isolate a gene of gene fragment of your interest. And, uh, and once you are isolated the gene, frag gene uh, fragment of your interest then you can be able to clone that into a suitable vector and you can be able to use that for downstream applications. When the gene sequence is known then you can be able to very straightforward you can be able to do a PCR and you can be able to use generate the fragments and that can be cloned directly into the uh, particular type of vectors. So, that approach we are not discussing at this moment, but we will discuss when we will discuss about the PCR in a later lectures. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in a subsequent lecture we are discussing about the more aspect related to gene cloning. Thank you.